Matthew Poole delves into Galatians 6.11, in which the Apostle Paul draws attention to the manner in which he has composed his letter to the Galatian church. Paul states, Ye see how large a letter I have written unto you with mine own hand, which Poole interprets as an extraordinary testament to Paul's dedication and personal concern for the Galatian believers. In contrast to his usual practice in other epistles, where Paul often employed a scribe or secretary known as an amanuensis to write down his words as he dictated them, he makes it clear that this epistle differed in that he penned it entirely by himself. Poole points to Romans 16.22 as an example of where Paul acknowledges Tertius as the scribe, and to 1 Corinthians 16.21 to show that on occasion Paul would write only the greeting in his own hand, thereby authenticating the letter. Yet in the case of the Galatians, Paul ensures they understand that every word came directly from his hand. This action carries significant implications. In the context of the ancient world, personal handwriting was a mark of authenticity and importance. By stating this, Paul is emphasizing the gravity of the message he is delivering to them, an urgent correction of their theological errors, and a reassurance of his apostolic authority. Poole sees Paul's commitment to write the full letter himself as a strong demonstration of his love and pastoral care. To the reader, it is intended to signal a deep level of engagement with their spiritual state, and a desire to lead them back to the truth of the gospel. The effort may be reflective of the magnitude of the issues at hand, possibly implying a situation that Paul considered dire enough to warrant his fullest attention and direct intervention through his writing. Also, the personal handwriting serves to accentuate the legitimacy of Paul's position and the doctrines he is affirming, reinforcing his role as their teacher and spiritual guide. It builds a closer connection between him and the recipients, reducing the distance by virtue of this personal touch. The physical act of writing, laborious as it can be, thus becomes a metaphor for the diligent care that Paul, as an apostle, pastor, and teacher, is extending to the Galatian congregation. Moreover, Poole addresses the motivations of certain Judaizing teachers, who were insisting that Gentile Christians undergo circumcision. Poole criticizes these teachers for their superficial piety and false pretenses of religiosity. He suggests that their true intent was not to uphold the law of God for its own sake, nor out of genuine concern for the spiritual welfare of the Galatians. Instead, these teachers were acting primarily out of self-interest, seeking to make a fair show to the world by outward conformity to Jewish customs effectively shielding themselves from the persecution faced by Christians. In the context of the Roman Empire, where both Jewish and pagan authorities persecuted the early Christians, those who observed Jewish rites and ceremonies, such as circumcision, could benefit from certain accommodations. The Roman government, through some of its edicts, allowed Jews to practice their religion. Teachers advocating for circumcision likely thought that this concession could extend to Christians who appeared to conform to Jewish traditions. Thus they could present themselves as adherents to Judaism, avoiding the ire that fell on Christians who stood firm in their gospel freedom without yielding to the constraint of the old law. By urging circumcision for these reasons, Poole argues that these teachers were circumventing the true essence of Christian discipleship, which involves bearing the cross of Christ. They were avoiding persecution not out of a principled stance but to maintain a comfortable existence, free from the trials that come with wholehearted commitment to the teachings of Christ. Poole subtly reprimands this behavior, insisting that persecution for the sake of Christ should not be shunned. It is instead part of the Christian life, a reflection of the sacrifices made by Christ himself, actions that are to be embraced rather than avoided. Poole's analysis sheds light on the struggle within the early church, between adhering to the old Judaic laws and embracing the new covenant of faith in Christ. He reaffirms that the path of true Christian faith may be fraught with hardships. But it is by enduring these hardships, not by avoiding them, that the faithful are to live out the gospel. Furthermore, Poole provides a critical examination of the motives behind certain teachers' insistence on circumcision within the early Christian community. Poole expounds on the conduct of these teachers who, though ostensibly advocating adherence to Jewish law by promoting circumcision, are accused of not keeping the entire law themselves. He identifies an innate contradiction in their behavior asserting that while these teachers have accepted the physical mark of circumcision, thereby ostensibly aligning themselves as debtors to the whole law, they, in reality, fail to live up to the comprehensive demands of the law. According to Poole, these teachers do not pursue the enforcement of circumcision out of a sincere belief in its spiritual significance or because they honor the law. Instead, 
Their fervor for circumcision is blasted as a facade, a mere means to an ulterior end. The aim for them is not to guide new converts toward a deeper understanding or observance of religious tenets, but rather to acquire bragging rights and to boast about their ability to influence and increase their count of followers. They intend to glory in your flesh as expressed in the scripture, pinning their pride on the physical rather than the spiritual transformation of their converts. Poole thereby insinuates a severe critique of these false teachers who focus on external appearances and symbolic gestures over the true essence of faith. He highlights the risk that such leaders pose to the spiritual integrity of the community by placing emphasis on superficial displays of piety, which mislead and potentially ensnare followers in a false sense of righteousness. The core of Poole's message is a caution against those who prioritize self-aggrandizement and the flaunting of influence, warning the faithful to discern and distance from religious authority that strays from the authentic and liberated practice of the Christian faith as Paul taught it. In his view, the virtue of Christianity is diluted when leaders contort religious practice to serve their egos, rather than committing to a life that wholly embodies the principles and compassionate ethos of their professed creed. In addition, Poole dives into the Apostle Paul's profound declaration of finding glory exclusively in the cross of Jesus Christ. Poole interprets this as a clear rejection of personal glory or pride in the achievements of evangelical work, such as converting others. For Paul, the only source of true glory lies in the gospel's message and in his own sufferings endured for its propagation. This stance reflects a deep conformity with Christ, who also suffered for the sake of the gospel. Poole explicates the phrase, The world is crucified unto me, and I unto the world, understanding it as an expression of mutual disinterest between Paul and worldly pursuits or honors. This disinterest, according to Poole, stems from the transformation brought about by Christ's cross. The cross here symbolizes not only the physical act of Christ's crucifixion, but also the grace that emanates from it. This grace is what empowers Paul to adopt an attitude of indifference towards the transient and often superficial values of the world. In Poole's view, Paul's statement reflects a deep-seated detachment from worldly values, a detachment mirrored in Christ's own disregard for worldly acclaim and his endurance of suffering during the crucifixion. This parallel between Paul and Christ is crucial in understanding Paul's statement. It's not a mere disinterest in worldly matters, but a profound spiritual transformation that aligns him with Christ's experience and teachings. Further, Poole notes that Paul's indifference to the world is reciprocated. The world despises and rejects both Paul and the doctrine he preaches. Yet through Christ's grace, Paul remains steadfast, his focus fixed on the spiritual rather than the temporal. Poole's interpretation thus indicates the transformative power of Christ's sacrifice, which enables true believers to transcend worldly desires and sufferings finding their ultimate glory and purpose in the cross of Christ. Besides, Poole digs deeply into the essence of Christian faith as presented by the Apostle Paul, maintaining a significant shift from Jewish law to Christian grace. Poole explains that in the context of Christ's teachings, traditional Jewish rituals like circumcision become irrelevant in determining one's relationship with God. Instead, what matters most is the transformation that occurs within an individual through faith in Jesus Christ. In his commentary, Poole contrasts the Old Covenant under which physical circumcision was a critical sign of one's commitment to God, with the new covenant established by Christ. Under the old law, circumcision was a symbol of God's covenant with the Jewish people, distinguishing them from Gentiles, who were considered outsiders to God's promises. This ritual was a physical manifestation of being part of God's chosen people. However, Poole points out that with the coming of Christ and the establishment of the gospel, such physical markers lose their spiritual significance. In the new order of faith, it is not the outward signs that matter, but the inward transformation. This transformation is described as a rebirth or regeneration by the Holy Spirit, where the old self, with its sinful and worldly ways, is replaced by a new spiritually alive self. This new state of being is characterized by a renewed heart and mind, aligned with God's will. Poole references other biblical passages, such as Galatians 3.28, 5.6 and 2 Corinthians 5.17 to reinforce his point that in Christ, there is a transcendence of former divisions like Jew and Gentile. The real measure of faith and relationship with God is now seen in one's spiritual rebirth and renewal. This perspective reiterates the universal nature of Christ's message and the inclusive embrace of all, regardless of their ethnic or religious background, into the Christian faith through a profound inner transformation. Additionally, Poole examines the Apostle Paul's message to the Galatians, 
particularly focusing on the concept of the rule that Paul refers to. Poole interprets this rule in a multidimensional way. Firstly, he considers it as the entirety of Scripture, suggesting that Paul is urging adherence to the broad teachings of the Bible. Alternatively, Poole suggests that the rule could specifically refer to the teachings in the epistle itself or even more narrowly to the immediate context where Paul speaks about the irrelevance of physical markers like circumcision in defining one's faith. The key message in this verse, as Poole sees it, is the transition from external religious symbols to an internal transformation of the heart. This shift is pivotal in Christian doctrine, repeating a faith rooted in spiritual change over ritualistic practices. The mention of peace and mercy in the verse is interpreted by Poole either as a prophecy or a prayer for those who follow this spiritual pathway. These terms are seen as encompassing all forms of goodness and blessings, both spiritual and material. A significant aspect of Poole's interpretation is his analysis of the term Israel of God. He distinguishes between the traditional ethnic Israelites and what he terms the true spiritual followers of God. This distinction aligns with the teachings in Romans 2.28, 29 and Jesus' description of Nathaniel in John 1.47. According to Poole, the Israel of God refers to believers in Jesus Christ, encompassing all, irrespective of their ethnic or cultural background. This interpretation underlines a fundamental shift in the Christian understanding of what it means to be chosen or blessed by God. It moves away from a purely ethnic identity to a faith-based community, stressing the inclusive nature of Christianity. Poole's commentary thus provides a deeper understanding of Paul's teachings, underscoring spiritual transformation and inclusivity in the Christian faith. Also, Poole explores the Apostle Paul's profound statement, From henceforth, let no man trouble me, for I bear in my body the marks of the Lord Jesus. Poole's interpretation is both detailed and insightful shedding light on the context and the profound implications of Paul's words. Poole explains that Paul's request for others not to trouble him arises from a background of theological debates and controversies, particularly those concerning the Christian view on circumcision. In the early Christian community, there was a significant debate about whether non-Jewish converts to Christianity needed to follow Jewish customs, especially circumcision. Paul, in his epistle, emphasizes his stance firmly against this notion dismissing the idea that adherence to such laws is necessary alongside faith in Christ. Moreover, Poole interprets the marks of the Lord Jesus in a metaphorical sense. These marks are not physical scars, but rather symbolic of the sufferings and hardships Paul endured for his faith and his missionary work. Poole accentuates that these hardships are proof of Paul's unwavering dedication and commitment to the teachings of Jesus Christ. The term marks here is symbolic of the persecution, hardships, and various trials Paul faced especially the opposition he encountered from both Jewish and Gentile communities. These sufferings, according to Poole, serve as a testimony to the gospel. They demonstrate Paul's dedication and the authenticity of his teachings. By referring to his sufferings as the marks of Jesus, Paul aligns his experiences with the sufferings of Christ, suggesting a form of spiritual kinship or identification with the sufferings of Christ. In essence, Poole's interpretation of this verse affirms the depth of Paul's commitment to the Christian gospel. It asserts the idea that true faith is often proven in the face of adversity, and that the sufferings endured for the sake of faith are not merely personal trials, but are integral to the Christian testimony and experience. This passage, therefore, serves as an affirmation of Paul's apostolic authority and his deep-seated dedication to the message of Christ. Last but not least, Poole provides a detailed interpretation of the final verse in the Apostle Paul's epistle to the Galatians. In this verse, Paul concludes with a prayerful wish, The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Amen. Poole perceives this closing as characteristic of Paul's style, commonly found in his other epistles. He interprets the term grace in this context as a comprehensive term encompassing all the effects of God's unconditional love on the souls of believers. This grace, according to Poole, is not just a general blessing, but is intricately connected to the merits and person of Jesus Christ. It's a divine influence that believers are meant to experience deeply within their hearts and spirits. Poole highlights the transformative power of this grace. It's meant to quicken, which means to bring spiritual life and energy, to strengthen, providing fortitude and faith and resilience against challenges, to comfort, offering solace and reassurance in times of doubt or suffering, and to establish ensuring a firm, unshakable foundation in their spiritual journey. These varied aspects signify the different ways in which the Spirit of Grace manifests itself in the life of a believer. 
regarding the epistle's postscript unto the Galatians written from Rome, Poole offers an insight into the historical context and authenticity of such notations. He advises that these annotations at the end of apostolic letters should not be regarded as divinely inspired scripture, noting the presence of occasional inaccuracies. However, he acknowledges the common scholarly belief that this particular letter was likely penned during Paul's imprisonment in Rome. This belief is partly inferred from references within the letter, notably verse 17, hinting at Paul's circumstances of suffering and imprisonment. Yet, Poole is careful to note that there is no definitive certainty about the exact place and time of the letter's composition, reflecting a scholarly caution in ascribing specific historical context to biblical texts. In conclusion, Poole probes into the Apostle Paul's unique approach in writing his letter to the Galatian church. Unlike his other epistles, where Paul often employed a scribe, in this instance he personally pens the letter, a fact Poole sees as indicating the seriousness and authenticity of his message. This direct involvement is interpreted as a testament to Paul's deep concern and commitment to the Galatians, intending to correct their theological misunderstandings and reaffirm his apostolic authority. Furthermore, Poole criticizes Judaizing teachers in the early church, who advocated for Gentile Christians to undergo circumcision. He contends that their insistence was less about spiritual fidelity and more about avoiding persecution by conforming to Jewish customs. By doing so, they could evade the hardships faced by Christians, a stance Poole sees as contrary to the essence of Christian discipleship, which involves embracing Christ's cross and suffering for faith. In addition, Poole discusses the contradiction in the behavior of these teachers. While they promoted circumcision, they did not adhere fully to the Jewish law. Poole interprets their actions as seeking personal glory rather than guiding new converts towards true spiritual understanding. Further, Poole reflects on Paul's statement of glorying exclusively in the cross of Jesus Christ. This view, according to Poole, represents a deep commitment to the gospel, transcending worldly pursuits and aligning with Christ's sufferings. The Apostles' focus on spiritual rather than temporal matters showcases the transformative power of Christ's grace. Besides, Poole maintains the transition from the Old Covenant, signified by physical rituals like circumcision, to the New Covenant of Christian grace. This new covenant values inner spiritual transformation over outward religious symbols, a shift that points out the inclusive nature of Christianity beyond ethnic or religious backgrounds. Lastly, Poole's analysis of Paul's concluding verse in the epistle reiterates the Apostle's desire for the believers to experience the comprehensive effects of Christ's grace in their spiritual journey. This grace is seen as vital for spiritual life, strength, comfort, and establishment in faith. Poole's interpretations offer a nuanced understanding of Paul's teachings, repeating spiritual transformation, inclusivity, and the importance of genuine faith in the Christian journey.